God's perfect plan has never skipped a beat, never missed a note. Even before Luther and the Reformation, men were believing the truth and working at reforming the truth and the church, reforming the church. And this afternoon, we're going to focus our attention on another colossus of Reformed theology from the 14th and 15th centuries, John Huss or Jan Hus, still a generation or two before Martin Luther. But before we do that, I want to spend just a few moments looking at a lady called Anne of Bohemia so we can try and tie some of these movements together. Between Waldo and Huss was another man called John Wycliffe in England. That was a different problem for the Roman Catholic Church. You remember that Waldo wasn't ordained. That was the way they tried to stop him. You don't have the authority to do this. Well, Wycliffe was ordained. Wycliffe did have the authority to preach and read God's Word. And so they had to uh, try all sorts of other approaches to stop him. Well, Anne of Bohemia lived during the time of John Wycliffe and was very sympathetic to his teaching. Another forerunner to the Reformation in, in England. And Anne was the oldest daughter of Charles IV from his fourth wife and sister of King Wenceslaus, who was King of Bohemia, Emperor of Germany. She was born in Prague in 1366, which is now modern-day Czech Republic. And Bohemia is the western part of the Czech Republic, and borders change, we, we know that. But it's an area with the stunning Austrian mountains to the south and Germany to the west and north. Now, Bohemians are Slavic people, Balkan, Russian, different culture from the Roman Empire, just a few miles away. We know it's common practice for royal family, families from different countries to intermarry. It's a way of building alliances. It's sometimes hard to get all the different links and connections straight. So there are ties here with, with Poland uh, to the northeast of Bohemia as well. We learned that Anne was a very bright young girl. She learned the scriptures from her youth under what seemed to be some some good men. She not only absorbed the, the scriptures, but asked many questions. And she, as a young girl, came to see the errors of the Roman church. It said importantly that she loved the author of the scriptures. And as she grew, discussions begin about, well, okay, who is she going to marry? Who is strategic? Who is, who is suitable? And Richard II was chosen, son of Edward. Uh, who was the Prince of Wales, also known as the Black Prince. Richard was born in France. It was his mother, Joan, who stepped in at one point and saved John Wycliffe in England at one of his trials. So, at least uh, in part, in this family, is sympathy for John Wycliffe amongst some of them. Anne and Richard were married at age 15 at Westminster in London. They'd heard of each other, but they'd never met. But Anne apparently knew about the writings and teaching and preaching of Wycliffe, and so she thought that London would be a, a good place to go for her. Probably not the greatest motivation to, to marry somebody, but I can't imagine that was the main reason. It happens like this. You're part of the aristocracy, and you're moving to a whole new country. So, so Anne packs up her belongings and brings her friends and servants many of whom were told were true believers, Christians, against the established church. We're told that England fell in love with this gentle and kind queen, and she cared for the poor and widows and orphans. Some say that it wasn't uncommon to have as many as 6,000 people eating at the royal table because of her influence, many of them poor. And she became known as Good Queen Anne, Apparently, Richard and her were very much in love, and she did these things because she was motivated by Christ-likeness. She wanted to be more like Christ, and she was an avid Bible reader. 
She had it in three languages, and that was extremely unusual for the time. And it would be very dangerous for any normal person to do this. But she treasured it. She talked, she talked about it openly, publicly. In fact, there's an account of a conversation we, she had with the Archbishop of York, and today that's the second in command in the Church of England, a man called Arundel. And she openly explained to him how she loved the Scriptures. Well, Arundel certainly didn't, and certainly didn't want others to be reading it, especially not in their own language, but he was powerless. He couldn't do anything. She's the Queen. John Wycliffe was extremely pleased when he heard that the Queen was studying Scripture for herself, and he compared her to to Mary sitting at the feet of, of Jesus. And she and her mother-in-law, as I mentioned, protected Wycliffe and would, would speak to the king and try to influence however she could. She apparently read him Matthew 23, 34 through 35 to her husband in English, which talks of persecution and, and spilling righteous blood on earth. And She's, she's telling him indirectly, you, you don't want to be guilty of killing a prophet, speaking of John Wycliffe. Well, on, Ju on June 7, 1394, Anne died of the plague at age 27, buried in Westminster. But you see, there is a greater divine purpose here, and this is the, the critical link, because after she died, Many of those friends, many of those servants returned across the water, across land, back to their homeland, Bohemia, with copies of the Gospels, with copies of some of Wycliffe's writings. Some went on to Oxford and came back at different times as well. So this is where we find our link from England over to Bohemia and John Huss, another great forerunner of the Reformation. Peter Waldo in France, John Wycliffe in England, and then God's providence brings the truth through tragic circumstances to Bohemia. And he's gone, but God uses that to trigger a mighty work somewhere else, hundreds of miles away. Let's look at the man, John Huss. We think he was born in 1372, which makes him almost a teenager when Wycliffe died all those miles away in England. And the famous words were spoken as his ashes were, were dumped into the river Swift, that the Swift flows into the Severn, the Severn flows into the ocean, and therefore the Word of God spreads all over the world. And that's what's happening. Hus grew up in a small rural, rural town called Husenitz in the south of Bohemia. When he was young, his father died, and they were poor, and even though they did not have much, his mother prioritized his education, and he attended the University of Prague. In fact, in time, someone in authority, a, a, a rich man, stepped in and helped pay the fees. And as he studied, he got himself jobs to help. Importantly, he was a, a servant to one of the professors. Now, one of the great benefits of doing that at that time was that you had access to your professor's books. And there is a, a strange account of John Huss when he was reading as a student at the University of, of Prague, and it was a winter's evening. And apparently, he was reading a book called The Life of Lawrence. It was about a martyr and his sufferings. And apparently, John Huss got so engaged in reading the story that he shoved his own hand into the fire in some kind of strange test. Uh, as this man was martyred in, in that way, he said, I was only trying what part of the tortures of this holy man I might be capable of enduring. Now that's, that's a bit strange, but it was also a foreshadowing of what would happen to him in the future. He was a hardworking student, and by the age of 26, he became a priest and also a professor in that same university in, in Prague. So remember, he's a Roman Catholic. He's, he's qualified. He's dedicated to their teaching. And it was at this point that all the pieces fit together in God's providence. When a British student handed him the writings of John Wycliffe that had been brought all the way, 
as I described. First, his reaction was one of alarm. Throw them in the river, he said. They were dangerous, but his interest was piqued, and he began to study. And alongside this, he was beginning to notice the behavior, the, the corruption of the religious leaders all around him in his groups, group of, of peers. Well, his searching led him to the Bible itself as, as Wycliffe intended. He had to find out if these things were true, and he read them daily, and he talked much with a man called Jerome of Prague. He came to the conclusion that Wycliffe was right. He embraced him mostly. His eyes were open to these truths presented by Wycliffe and critically supported by Scripture. We can't say he believed all of what are called Wycliffe's principles, but certainly the, the vast majority. And as a consequence, he became concerned about his own soul. His sin troubled him like never before, and he, he knew he needed a solution. One writer tells us, the Holy Spirit opened his eyes to see the Savior, who is the only remedy for sin. By faith, he trusted in the sacrifice of Christ Jesus, and his sins were forgiven. In his own words, he later said of his conversion that I used formerly to think only of what charms the ear and the eye, but it pleased the Lord to save me from the fire of Sodom. Then I began to admire the truth of the Word of God. Christ opened my mind to understand. I perceived the corruption of the times, and my heart was lighted up with heartfelt and powerful fire, which since then has never left me. There's an account of another student who came to Huss and noticed somehow that he was studying the books of Wycliffe. And this student said in a not very complimentary way that by a decree of the Council of Constance, Wycliffe had been sent to hell. Huss's reply was, I only wish that my soul may reach the place where that excellent Britain now dwells. We learn that more of Wycliffe's writings arrived some came through Jerome of Prague, through, some from those uh, students uh, coming back from Oxford University and others from employees of the Queen coming back at different times. In particular, those on Sola Scriptura, the Bible alone, really affected him. And Huss copied some of these books for his own use and published them, sometimes thought for thought or paraphrases under his own name not Wycliffe's, which is a little bit strange, but apparently it was an accepted practice at the time. So Huss was not really an original theologian, but rather he popularized Wycliffe in a different language, in a different, different place. He was a priest, a theological and, and philosophy lecturer, but now he's, a, now he's a Christian, and he becomes a real preacher. And in 1402, he was asked to join the Bethlehem Church of Prague, and the people loved him, and he loved them. And this is one of the places that becomes a hotbed of reform, a little bit like Geneva would years later with John Calvin and, and others. As he began to develop his independent thinking, still a work in progress theologically, he used this pulpit to point out the errors of the established church, the corruption, the hypocrisy of the lives of the religious leaders, and, and many began to, to attend, including royalty in the area. And he became famous, and like Wycliffe, Huss taught that piety and purity were important alongside the sole authority of the Bible. And therefore, preaching from the Bible for Huss was of paramount importance. And this was a kind of a protected church which existed before Huss, and on the walls of the church were contrasting pictures which, which did not flatter the Pope at all. So one example might be uh, the Pope in one picture on, on a horse in all his pomp, and next to it was Christ walking barefoot. Another one on the wall showed Jesus washing his disciples' feet, and right next to it was a picture of the Pope's feet being kissed. As has become the, the pattern, the, the Roman church didn't react well. And in 1403, they called a public meeting, and they condemned Wycliffe, and by extension, Huss. Huss and others tried to, to stop the meetings, 
but they failed. And here we see two groups developing and dividing over an Englishman's writings years after they were written, which seems strange, 700 miles away across a few countries. But what they're really fighting over were the truths of Scripture, which become evident when you are actually able to read it for yourself in your own language. The local ch clergy tried to stop the preaching, but the problem for them was that the Queen of Bohemia was an attendee at the church and, and liked him. They didn't have much success, so they wrote to the Pope, accusing Huss of heresy. By 1409, a message had come back from the Pope that the local archbishop should investigate, root out, stop any heresy in the area. And as a result, Huss again was ordered to stop preaching and all of his books were confiscated with Wycliffe's and they were made into a, a big bonfire. But of course, they didn't get them, them all and Huss just kept on preaching. In fact, many different attempts were made to stop him, even excommunication from the church in 1410. But he just kept going, preaching the truth on the one hand and preaching against the errors of the church on the other hand. He was bold, even when they put one of his close friends into prison. And as opposition grew, three men from a, a lower class who had stood against the Pope were beheaded. They felt that was safe to do without causing an, an uproar. And as we see in many of these cases, Huss's teaching is still somewhat syncretistic, mixed a mix of evangelical and Protestant teaching as we would recognize it with, with remnants of Roman Catholic teaching. He strongly emphasizes the glory of God, salvation by faith alone through Christ, and the necessity to obey the Scriptures. He was, he was involved in a revision of the Czech version of the Bible. He highly valued preaching and taught that all believers are part of the, the priesthood, in the church services, they would sing hymns, which was unusual as he tried to lead the church to a more biblical model, looking at the teaching of Christ and the necessity of godliness. He taught at that time about predestination uh, quite openly and, and clearly. He, he said, we are chosen by God. And he concluded that the Catholic hierarchy was among the non-elect, meaning that they were false shepherds of, of the flock. He teaches clearly about the absolute sovereignty of God. He writes that God alone has the power to kill and make alive, to destroy and to save, and to preserve His faithful ones in diverse sore perils, and to grant unto them the eternal life with joy unspeakable. He understood the sinfulness, the depravity of man. He said, man is prone to greed, pride, luxury, the forsaking and despising of God's Word. He tells us how we are ensnared by sin and destined for hell in our natural condition before God. There are varying degrees of, of clarity among these forerunners to the Reformation. Hus still holds on to purgatory, still to transubstantiation, the real body and blood presence in, in the Mass, much like Luther after him. Hus was more moderate than Wycliffe in his criticisms of the Roman Catholic Church. And Huss's uh, request for reform was, was linked with politics, clouded by that, kind of a, alongside a movement for independence from the Roman Empire. This will help if we change our religion to also sever ties with that group over there. So not everybody was motivated by uh, the same reasons. He pointed out with evidence that popes are not infallible and provided evidence that they have erred many times. He attacks the, the Catholic seven sacrament system and he holds fast to the, his view that preaching from the Bible is at the very heart, the true heart of ordained ministry. 1411, he begins preaching against indulgences and this caused a big problem because this is the income for the church. And he, in doing that, he used a chapter from Wycliffe which said, No pope has a right to take, up the, uh, to take up the sword in the name of the church, and he should pray for his enemies and bless those that curse him. Man obtains forgiveness of sins by genuine repentance and faith in Christ, not by money given. 
You see, they would sell these certificates to people to forgive their sins or the sins of their relatives, alive or dead. And how much you gave could mean heaven or hell, forgiveness or destruction. It's the difference between your sweet grandmother who died 20 years ago, suffering in hell or purgatory, that kind of Roman Catholic halfway house, uh, and going to heaven. How much do you love your grandma? It it was a money-making scam at its core, and he declares indulgences useless since God freely bestows forgiveness on all who truly repented. Well, when he started preaching in Prague about this abuse, the Pope had to do something radical. And so he stopped all church services at every church as long as Huss was anywhere near the city. Huss was excommunicated and he threatens, the Pope threatens to place Prague under a papal interdict. No sacraments allowed except the last rites. And and that in the mind of the common man means you're cut off from the church, You're, you're cut off from heaven. No hope. One of the strongest threats that he has. And and Huss is concerned by this and he moves away to southern Bohemia and he continues to teach and write his views and he'd made powerful enemies now and some supporters drew back, some hesitated. As he was being kicked out of Prague, he said this, the wicked have begun by preparing a treacherous snare for a goose. But if even the goose, which is only a domestic bird, a peaceful animal, and whose flight is not very far in the air, has nevertheless broken through their toils. Other birds, soaring more boldly towards the sky, will break through them with still greater force. Instead of a feeble goose, the truth will send forth eagles and keen-eyed vultures. I'm going to come back to that reference as we get towards the end. Hus moved out of Prague in 1412 and started preaching in smaller places, often hidden away from the public gaze. And as a result, the gospel truth began to spread because he's forced into another area. It's an interesting pattern that when persecution comes, God can use it in time, uh, use it and time and time again to spread the gospel all around. And when the Roman church began to realize that rather than diminishing these teachings were spreading like wildfire. They had to try something different again, and the Pope sent a letter to the Emperor of Germany and ordered that he call together a meeting in Constance, and the Emperor was told to gather the bishops and professors and then invite Hus along. Now, naturally, Hus's friends said, this, this is a bad idea. You, don't, you shouldn't go to this. It's too dangerous. The emperor, though, promised Hus what is called safe passage. You'll be safe. You'll be allowed to leave regardless of what is decided at the meeting. It's a guarantee. Let me read you the English translation. It says, Sigmunds, Sigmunds, which is the name of the emperor, by the grace of God, chosen emperor of the Romans, perpetual defender of the empire, king of Hungary, to all the ecclesiastical and secular princes, dukes, margraves, counts, lords, in whatever city, village, community, or place whatever, who are faithful subjects to us and the Holy Roman Empire, and who will either see or hear this document, venerable, high-born, noble, dear, and faithful, we greet you well. We have taken under special shelter and protection of ourselves and the Holy Empire, the most honourable and upright professor, John Huss, Bachelor of Divinity and Master of Arts, the bearer of this, who is on his way from uh, Bohemia to the general council held at Constance. We also command you, all and each, to protect him when he comes to you, to receive him hospitably, to entertain him honourably, and to assist him in whatever may accelerate his journey or render it safe whether by by land or water, or to be willing to allow him, his servants, and all that he has to pass through, remain in, and again return through, all the passes, harbours, bridges, counties, dominions, districts, jurisdictions, cities, towns, boroughs, villages, and all places peaceably, without toil or tribute, or without any annoyance. And if need should be, to provide him with special escort for the sake and honour of the glory of our majesty." given under your, our hand at Spires, 16th day of October, 1414. 
It's watertight. And the Pope said, had he killed my own brother, not a hair of his head should be touched during his stay here. Just before the meeting, Hus finished and published De Ecclesia, or Concerning the Church, and in there he challenged the claim of the Pope for ultimate authority. He said in there, they were not the church. The church had once existed without them. The foundation of the church is Christ, not Peter. Augustine said the same thing a thousand years earlier. So, Hus went along to this meeting in the fall of 1414. This is what he said to his friends as he left them, sounding very much like the Apostle Paul to Timothy. You know that I have taught you the truth. Continue in the truth and trust in the mercy of God. Beware of false teachers. I am going to this great assembly where the Lord will give me grace to endure trials, imprisonment, and if it be his will, even the most dreadful death. Whatever happens, our joy will be great when we meet in the everlasting mansions. You see immediately from that that Hus didn't quite trust these people, but he did trust his God. Having been summoned, Hus traveled to Constance, and on his way, several communities came out to encourage him. He was expecting a debate, and when he arrived, he sent a message to the Pope. He was already there. I'm, I'm ready to meet, I'm ready to discuss and defend all the charges that have been made against me. And what's called a, a, a conclave was organized and Hus went along respectfully, unembarrassed. And as it began, they looked him up and down and someone said, Professor, many and various are the reports we have heard respecting thee. And verily, if all be true, impossible is it that thou shouldest go unpunished. It is, said, it is said that thou hast plunged Bohemia into the most palpable errors to answer for which thou art now before us. This is how Hus replied, Reverend fathers, my mind has been so constituted from my youth that I would rather die than promulgate errors. For this cause am I come to the council, that my errors may be pointed out to me, and that with sorrow and contrition of heart, I may renounce them. They didn't expect that reply. And the Pope blurted out, if thou doest so, thou wilt do well. And then they rushed from the hall with the cardinals, and it seems like a what do we do now moment. And immediately the Pope responded by putting Hus in a cage on the cathedral platform, and then a dark wet dungeon, which was part of a Dominican monastery by the riverside. The Pope broke his word. He lied about, having, about Hus having safe conduct, but he justified it by saying this, it is no sin to break a promise to a heretic. Elsewhere he said it was the cardinals that arrested him, not himself, so it wasn't his fault. Others made up stories about how Hus had tried to escape and so they were simply restraining him. Hus appeared three times before the council and whenever he spoke, they would shout over him, recantation or death, recantation or death. He was asked to renounce his teachings, those of Wycliffe. He said, I would not for a chapel full of gold recede from the truth. They tried a watered down recantation, but Hus was not interested. He said he would give up life sooner than sacrifice the truth. There was another time where he stood before them he said, I will listen to your instructions. They spotted that he didn't say he, that he would abide by their decisions. Hus was asked if he would obey the Pope's decisions, and he said, yes, as long as they agree with the doctrines of Christ as they are set forth in the Bible. But when I see the contrary, I will not obey them, even if you burn my body. Another time he answered, most noble Lord, the omniscient, speaking of God, is my witness that I am not aware of having ever taught, preached, or written aught against God's Word or the Christian Church. Were such the fact, gladly would I now yield and retract all I have said. Till I am convinced of my errors, my only wish is to be better versed in the Scriptures and to adhere to what is taught rather than to any opinions of my own. One of the bishops exclaimed, 
Art thou wiser than the whole council? No, said Hus. Send the least of your members here, that he may instruct me from the Scriptures. If I do willingly listen to one individual, how much more readily should I attend to the whole body? The bishop shouted out in reply, obstinate heretic. You can read Huss responding article by article to all the allegations against him in Fox's Book of Martyrs. It's quite an extensive list. And to some of the accusations, he says, yes, this is true. Augustine says so, as does St. John in Holy Scripture. To others, he said, I've never said that, or my words have been mutilated. But he didn't hold back. And the emperor said to him, two alternatives alone remain for thee, submission and mercy, or obstinacy and punishment. Sometime around now that they again outlawed the Bible in the common language of the people. And while he was in prison, Hus thought more about his church back in Bohemia than, than about his defense that was coming up. A knight visited him who was trying all sorts of ways to get him out and argue on his behalf and said to him, busy yourself with your defense rather than with your dreams. Hus replied, I am no dreamer, but I maintain this for certain, that the image of Christ will never be effaced. They have wished to destroy it, but it shall be painted afresh in all hearts by much better preachers than myself. The nation that loves, loves Christ will rejoice at this, and I, awaking from the dead and rising, so to speak, from my grave, shall leap with great joy. In jail, he knew it was predetermined what would happen to him. He wrote, I confide altogether in my Savior. I trust that he will accord me with his Holy Spirit to fortify me in his truth, so that I may face with courage, temptations, prison, and if necessary, a cruel death. And this knight wrote back to all the parties in Bohemia to highlight what had happened, pointing in particular to the emperor who'd written the safe conduct paper to try to cover his own back. And all he did was write a, a strongly worded letter to the, to the Pope to try and um, help, but really didn't follow it up. And when news of, of this got back to Bohemia, caused great trouble, and Jerome of Prague set off for Constance, but was captured on the way and was brought into Constance in, in chains, put in prison as well, a different prison. And as a result of his injuries, Jerome couldn't sit for a year. A while later, John Huss was put on trial before the council for two days and then condemned. Certainly not a fair process. Treated as guilty the, the whole time. This was most definitely a foregone conclusion. He was walked to a prison, a house, which is now that museum, but some concluded that that isn't secure enough, and so he spent the last nine months of his life in a basement, not seeing the sun. He went in healthy, but he came out very sick and weak. There is some suggestion that they eventually moved him to a slightly better place where he was able to write some letters to people, have some food and receive visitors. Those who were against him tried to force him to admit he was wrong. Wycliffe was wrong. The teachings were wrong. The church were right. This is what Huss said. God will not permit me to deny his truth. And that's a lesson here. Truth is truth. In our world today, fewer and fewer people believe in absolute truth. It's, it's relative. It's what's true for, for me and true for you. You're not allowed to challenge my truth. But Scripture tells us that there is absolute truth, whether we accept it or not. In fact, it will remain true even if, no, even if no one believes it. I wonder if you've seen those bumper stickers that say coexist on them, made out of all those different symbols from different religions. The C is the crescent moon of Islam. The X is the star of David. The T is the cross meant to justify Christianity. Oh, oh in a sense, we must be peaceful with each other, but truth is truth. These religions make exclusive claims, which means that they can't all be right. It doesn't make sense. And as Christians, we, we can't sit back and see millions of people going to a lost eternity without, in love, telling them that they're wrong 
even if it costs us personally like it did with us. Surely that's the loving thing to do. You're lost. You're heading for eternal punishment. It's not about being right or proving a point or arrogance in any way. It's urgently telling people where they can find salvation like we did. And Huss's attitude was not one of defending himself, but one of saying, what can I do? This is the truth. Even if, even if I deny it, it still remains true. And by denying it, many will continue in darkness with false hope in a church system that leads to hell. For him, there was no option. For us, there's no option. Right in the middle of suffering, he did not find peace by denying the truth. He found peace in the author of the truth, the one who holds the keys to death and Hades, the only Savior. On July 5th, the night before his death, he wrote this, I write this letter in prison and with my fettered hand expecting my sentence of death tomorrow, when, with the assistance of Jesus Christ, we shall meet again in the delicious peace of the future life. You will learn how merciful God has shown himself towards me, how effectually he has supported me in the midst of my temptations and trials. July 6, 1415. He was condemned when he was summoned before the council again. It's reported that before he set off, he said, I will die today with joy in the faith of the gospel I have preached. The emperor was there holding his scepter with his crown on his head. On the final day, charges were read. Some were ridiculous. A doctor had heard Huss teaching that there were four persons in the Godhead, he himself being the fourth. Huss sprung up immediately exclaiming, tell me who that liar is. The bishop's reply is telling. He said, that is by no means necessary. All the nobles and bishops and everyone important was there for the sentence. It was a show. It was called a ceremony of degradation, an example to others who might dare to stand up against the church, might dare to preach against them. He was put on a platform so all could see him with soldiers all around him. He was sick. He wasn't going anywhere. He fell to his knees and prayed for help from his God. And after it all, Huss replied, I hasten to the, to the council, protected by a free passport from the emperor who is here present. And I came in full confidence that no violence would be offered to me and well prepared my support, to support my own conscience. Apparently the emperor went red and just looked at the floor until the Pope's judge stood up and started talking. He was condemned with a great uproar as he tried to defend himself. He shouted, Lord of thy unspeakable mercy, forgive my enemies. Thou knowest they have falsely accused me and have condemned me on the testimony of false witnesses. Yet, O thou all-merciful God, I beseech thee, lay not this sin to their charge. One historian says that at this point, indescribable indignation took possession of the fathers. Some gnashed their teeth. They were furious and scoffed him. One person, apparently though, did walk out at that point and wanted no part in it. I wonder if there's another story there. He was sentenced to death by burning. His response was this in a prayer. O Lord God, I beseech thee for thy mercy's sake, pardon all my enemies, for thou knowest that I have been falsely accused and unjustly condemned, but forgive their sins. People reacted there and they shouted, Judas, the betrayer of the Lord, he replied, I place all my confidence and hope in God my Savior. I know he will never take from me this cup of salvation, but that by his grace I shall drink of it today in his kingdom. Zero pity. They mocked him. They put a tall paper crown on his head, which had three devils painted on it, pictured tearing his soul apart with the word arch heretic on there. Huss said, my Lord Jesus bore a painful crown of thorns for me, a poor sinner, and died the shameful death of the cross. Therefore, for his sake, I will cheerfully bear this lighter crown. Bishop shouted, now we deliver your soul to Satan and to hell. He responded, but I commit my soul to my gracious Lord Jesus Christ. 
They dressed him up in white. Then they grabbed him down from the, the stage. They grabbed a chalice from him and called him Judas again. Picture, the picture they're giving here is that they're taking salvation and, uh, and redemption away from him, removing his clothes piece by piece, curse by curse during this. And then we come to the time of his death. He was taken to a field outside the city walls with 800 soldiers protecting him, which is ridiculous. Apparently he could hardly walk, but he was marched about a kilometer. The location then, some say, was an island in the middle of the Rhine. It's now a roundabout with an apartment building on it. But there's a stone there to remember the event. Everyone wanted to see him, but the crowd got too big, and so they had to shut the city gate to not let any more people out to see the execution. And the records say that Hus was calm, even joyful, on the journey. He walked past the archbishop's house as they were burning some of his books. Uh, we're told he smiled. This is interesting. This is why you need to take some accounts with a pinch of salt, because they tell us Hus's thoughts at this moment. But one historian says, Hus stood still, smiling at the folly of imagining that the destruction of mere inanimate books would necessarily involve that of the doctrine therein written. At some point he was heard crying out, O Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, have pity upon me. Some of the people following said, We do not know what teachings of this, the, the teachings of this man are, but all we hear from him are holy words and Christian prayers. And finally, they arrived at the place of execution. John fell on his knees and lifted his head and out loud prayed this over and over. Into thine hands I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. And then he said, Lord Jesus, I cheerfully suffer this terrible and cruel death for the sake of thy holy gospel and the preaching of thy sacred word. Do thou forgive my enemies the crime they are committing." He was forced to walk three times around the, the pyre, the stack of wood. He asked permission if he could address those who'd been looking after him in jail, and it was granted. He said, I thank you most sincerely for all the kindness you have shown me, for you have beh behaved to me more as brothers than as guards. Know also that my trust in my Savior is unshaken, for whose sake I willingly suffer this death, being assured that I shall be with him this day in paradise. The Duke of Bavaria pleaded with him to recant, but Hus replied loudly, I have ever taught according to God's word and will still hold fast the truth, which this very hour I shall seal with my death. The Duke is recorded to have run away, head in hands, crying. Then they put him up on the pyre, attaching him with wet ropes and chains, so the ropes lasted longer, didn't burn through too quickly. And when the chain was put around his neck, it said that he commented, is it thus you silence the goose? A hundred years hence, there will arise a swan whose singing you shall not be able to silence. Now, this is one of those remarkable accounts which you just don't know whether to believe or not. But listen to Charles Spurgeon and what he said. They burnt John Huss and Jerome of Prague. But Hus foretold as he died that another would arise after him, whom they should not be able to put down. And in due time, he more than lived again in Luther. Is Luther dead? Is Calvin dead today? That last man the moderns have tried to bury in misrepresentation, but he lives and will live, and the truths that he taught will survive, and all the calumniators that have sought to poison it will survive all those people. Now, when you look at some paintings from those centuries, some of them have Luther with a goose or a swan at his feet. You'll notice that from now on. Uh, referring back to, to this, there's a famous painting um, around that time where Luther is writing the 95 Theses on the door of the church at Wittenberg with a goose feather. And the end of the goose feather is reaching all the way across to Italy and knocking off the, pope, the Pope's crown. Then they piled up wood and straw around him, and they lit the fire. He didn't shout out in pain. 
Instead, he died singing hymns that the crowd and the guards could hear. He sang, Christ, Christ, thou Son of the living God, have mercy on me, and take me, take me to thyself to live with thee forever. Apparently, the smoke took its effect. It looked like he was praying, and then his head suddenly dropped. Not all his body was consumed. The top half wasn't completely burned, so they, they beat it. They took out his heart. They made a fresh fire, and they made sure it was all gone. Not only did they make sure they got all the ashes, but they dug four feet under where the fire was, put it all on a cart, and dumped it into the Rhine. That dumping ground was regarded now as cursed. He became a human torch as a testimony to the gospel, another servant sent and rejected. Even if some of his enemies ironically acknowledged his humility and godliness, he died with great courage. But you see, the death of Hus was not the end because he still had supporters and they began to fight a war. His martyrdom caused an uproar and turmoil in Bohemia because they knew he'd been promised that safe passage. He became a national hero. And when the king died, the people refused to accept his brother, the, the, the man who had given him that safe passage, that safe conduct document for, for Hus. And it said that the dying embers of Hus's funeral pile kindled the mountain fires of Bohemia. And the desire of revenging the fearful, the fearful death their immortalized, of their immortalized master and implanting his pure doctrines in the breasts of their children and their children's children increased. The Pope also became unpopular, declares a holy crusade against Bohemia, against the Hussites, but the Bohemians beat the, the Romans time and time again. We don't need to go into detail, but two religious parties, two separate groups or movements form after a division develops in the followers of, of Hus uh, over the doctrine of the, the church. We have the Taborites and the, the Eutraquists and and the, the latter were traditionalists, moderates, wanted to remain within the Roman Catholic Church, but have reforms. And uh, the Taborites were more radical in their rejection and uh, went much further in, in reform. And after a decade and a half, the Roman Catholics tried to sit down and negoti negotiate with the Eutraquists and at the Council of Basel to remain within the church. And they come to an agreement and they attack the other group. And, and crush them sadly. And these Taborites uh, are linked in some way with the Waldensians, the United Bohemian Brotherhood, about 300 to 400 uh, congregations, which too also would merge into the Reformation. And it was a law lasting 15 years until their leader was killed in 1421, and some went back to the Catholic Church, and others had splits and disagreements, but yet some uh, stayed faithful and were later called the Bohemian or the Moravian Brethren. You know there's a picture at the seminary of Jerome of Prague, Huss's right-hand man, who was also burned at the stake 11 months later in May 1416. He too was fearless and, and unterrified, and both made an even greater impact in Bohemia, in Bohemia when, when they died. Well, let's round up our thoughts. Mill Daubigny, the historian, wrote this about Hus. To him, the gospel was everything. And in publishing this, he cared little for persons and rank. He thought with the apostles, if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Galatians 1.10. One historian said this, the ashes of Wycliffe had hardly found rest in the swift river, place in England, when the Lord raised up John Huss to carry the torch lit by the great reformer and Bible translator. Following in the footsteps of his hero, Huss advanced the cause of the Christian truth and became an early martyr of the Reformation. Like his predecessor, Huss was faithful unto death. He was called the John the Baptist of the Reformation, the forerunner, the one preparing the way. Daubigny said, the flames of his Pyle kindled a fire in the church that cast a brilliant light into the surrounding darkness and whose glimmerings were not to be so readily extinguished. John Huss did more. Prophetic words issued from the depths of his dungeon. 
he foresaw that a real reformation of the church was at hand. It came in the form of Martin Luther. It's telling that Luther himself said that none of his teaching was new, for he had learned it all from Huss. Do you see how all these events play into each other in the providence of God? Wycliffe onto Huss, Huss onto Luther, and then beyond. Well, in conclusion, Luther said this, without knowing it, I both taught and held the teaching of Huss. In short, we were all Hussites. Reformers in the later years looked up to Huss for his unswerving commitment in the face of the church's cunning brutality. What an example he is to us, with the help of God, standing even those many years before the Reformation. Well, let's pray together. Great God of heaven and of earth, how we thank you for your truth. Lord, we thank you that it is unchanging and given to us in our own language. Lord, we pray that we would treasure it, that we would mine it, that we would look to it for all that we need in this life. Oh Lord, we pray that these examples that we've been looking at would help us, but that we would look beyond them to you. Lord, may all of this be to your honor and glory, we pray. In Jesus' precious and worthy name, amen.